Hey, good evening. I'm David Wildstein, the editor of the New Jersey Globe. Welcome to the debate between the candidates for the U.S. House of Representatives in New Jersey's third district between Congressman Andy Kim, the Democratic nominee, and Mr. David Richter, the Republican nominee. This hour-long debate is sponsored by the New Jersey Globe, and it's coming to you virtually with each candidate at their own location. It's one of the changes that all of us face during an era of a global health pandemic, and, and it's one that allows the candidates for Congress in this hugely important race to debate their opponents without placing anybody in danger. Uh, each candidate will have 90 seconds to make an opening statement. After that, I will ask a series of questions related to national and local issues and the campaign for Congress. Uh, I ask both candidates to stick to their allotted time. If a candidate goes too long, I'll, I'll simply hold my hand up uh, as a signal. If that doesn't work, then, then I will interrupt. Uh, these questions are mine. I have not discussed them with anyone. Uh, the questions will alternate between the two candidates. Each candidate will have one minute to answer. Uh, if a candidate is attacked during the response, uh, his opponent will receive an additional 30 seconds to respond. And I'd like to reserve the option of a follow-up question before moving on. Uh, my job as a moderator is to not take sides. It's to not give my opinion. Uh, it's to be a moderator. So that's exactly what I'll do tonight. I will moderate. Uh, I will try to keep this debate on track. Uh, I'll look to each of you to make sure that what your opponent says is based on fact. Each candidate will also have a chance to ask their opponent one question. Candidates will have 30 seconds to ask, ask their question and their opponent will have 60 seconds to respond. Uh, candidates will also have 90 seconds for a closing statement. Uh, prior to the start of this debate, we conducted a virtual uh, coin toss. Uh, Congressman Kim won the coin toss. He's opted to go first. And uh, welcome, Congressman. I'll ask you to make your opening statement. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for having us here. Good evening, everyone. I'm Andy Kim, and I wanted to start by saying, I hope you and your families are staying safe and healthy. In the midst of this pandemic, the people of Burlington County and Ocean County face a choice. Who can they trust to work for you in Congress? I've held 25 town halls since I've been sworn in, and with each one, I've taken the ideas that I've heard from people in this district and turned them into action. That means taking the pandemic seriously by fighting for more testing, more, more personal protective equipment, more resources, not just minimizing the risks we face in order to toe the line of the president who's more interested in the lies and the misinformation than keeping people safe. That means fighting for affordable and accessible health care and protecting people with pre-existing conditions, not supporting the Trump administration's efforts to gut the Affordable Care Act. That means working with members of both parties to support our small businesses during the pandemic by cutting red tape and delivering the resources our community needs, not refusing federal support because DC partisanship is more important than the people of New Jersey. And that means doing everything I can for our teachers, our education support professionals, our, our kids, our students, not saying that they should either show up or be fired. At the end of the day, we fight for this place because this is our home. It's where I was raised, it's where I'm raising my two baby boys. This community gave my family everything and it's been an honor and a lifetime to serve it. Thank you for trusting me to take your voice to Congress over the last two years. And I promise you that I will work always for Burlington County and Ocean County, the place we call home. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Richter, uh, it's time for your opening statement. Thank you, David. Uh, and thank you and the New Jersey Globe for hosting this debate tonight. Thank you to Congressman Kim for joining me. Uh, thank you to everybody who's tuning in, uh, particularly those who turned off the Eagles game to watch us. Uh, you know, this is the most important election of our lifetimes. There's no doubt about that. You know, not only do we have a president to, uh, to reelect, uh, to choose for the next four years, but this congressional race is incredibly important uh, here in South Jersey, and it may have national implications as well. Uh, the control of the House of Representatives could very well turn uh, on this race. Uh, and this is important. Uh, you know, I'm the father of four daughters. I care very deeply about my country uh, and my community. Uh, and that's why I'm running for Congress. 
Uh, 25 years ago, I was practicing law in New York City. I came home to South Jersey to help my dad save a, uh, a family construction business that was heading into bankruptcy. And we worked hard. We had 300 employees. That was more than just 300 people. That was 300 families that depended on our business for their survival. And we worked hard. We turned the business around. It was on the verge of bankruptcy for many years. But we did work hard. And when I left 20 years later uh, as the CEO of the company, we had built Hill International into one of the best firms in the world at what it did, helping to manage the construction of public works and infrastructure projects all over the world. Uh, when I left, we had 4,300 employees. So we created thousands and thousands of jobs uh, involved in some of the most important projects. And we did everything from help build schools to hospitals to airports and rail projects. We helped clean up the environment. We were called in on some of the biggest, most challenging projects in the world, from rebuilding the World Trade Center to cleaning up and rebuilding after the, uh, the war in Iraq. Uh, I'm very proud of my, my track record in business. And, and I wanna bring those same skills in turning around a business uh, to Congress. We very much need to turn around the economy. The last six months have been a disaster uh, for the economy, not just in New Jersey, but around the country. We need to build the economy back. We most importantly need to bring small business back uh, and the jobs that come with it. Uh, a lot of people have, uh, have lost their jobs in the last six months. And I think the skills that I can bring to Congress for the betterment of this district are important. Uh, and I hope you'll uh, support me in the election next month. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Richter, we'll start the first question with you. Uh, President Trump tested positive for COVID-19. Former Governor Chris Christie tested positive. They're both in the hospital. Uh, Bill Stepien, who has advised your campaign for Congress, has tested positive. So my question is, do you still think that New Jersey should remove all restrictions allowing restaurants and bars to fully reopen? Yeah, well, first of all, you know, my thoughts go out to the, uh, the first family, the president and the first lady. Um, I hope they recover quickly. Uh, the same for Governor Christie. Uh, and Bill Stepien has worked on and been involved in my campaign as well. But it also goes out to everybody out there who's suffered, who has been sick or still sick, uh, or who's lost a friend or family member. This has been a, a terrible tragedy. Uh, this pandemic has hit the entire world. Uh, and I think that we need to do everything we can to make sure that we recover from it as quickly as possible. Um, the pandemic is not behind us. There's no question about that. Uh, more people are going to get sick and, and more people are gonna die but we need to do everything we can to minimize the impact uh, from, from COVID. Uh, the economic implications as well are gonna last a lot longer. Uh, small businesses in the state uh, have been very much harmed by the actions that uh, Governor Murphy has taken. Uh, I think he acted appropriately in the spring, but there's no question that uh, you know, restaurants are not gonna survive the winter when outdoor dining is no longer an option. I think the, uh, the steps that they can take and have taken to keep their, uh, their guests safe, need to continue, uh, and we need to do everything else we can to make sure that, that uh, business reopens, but in, in a safe uh, and appropriate manner. Okay, and Congressman Kim, my, my, it's, this, is, this is a variation of the same question. Uh, back in March, after being exposed to a colleague who tested positive for COVID, uh, you experienced some symptoms and, and you self-quarantined for two weeks. Uh, uh, you, you tested negative. Uh, today, President Trump did a drive-by uh, for press and, and su supporters so they could see him. Uh, because the presidential election is a omnipresent force in, in your campaign for Congress, was, was it okay for the president to do that? No, absolutely not. No, it, look, we all want to make sure that the president and his family and all those that are testing positive that are suffering from this virus, I hope they recover quickly and in full. But when we understand the, the challenges that we face, we absolutely need to make sure that we are taking all the proper precautions to keep other people safe as well. There's a responsibility that comes with that. And what we see from the president's actions is again, just a, a disregard of the safety of others, not understanding fully the, the harm that can go away, uh, that can, can come of his actions. So. At, when, it, when it comes to that or when it comes to the lack of uh, national testing strategy or the lack of personal protective equipment, 
you know, the efforts that we tried to do right here to get a new thir a third test site during March and April here in South Jersey. And the White House told us no. Now we see it's because he just continues to have a disregard for other people's health and safety. And we see that right now, even after he's tested positive. Okay, and Mr. Richter, President Trump, whom you support, has said that overturning Roe v. Wade is possible uh, with Amy Coney Barrett on the Supreme Court. Uh, do you believe that Roe v. Wade ought to be reversed? Uh, no, I don't. You know, personally, I'm, I'm generally pro-choice. I think there are certain things that uh, the government should uh, restrict, like late term and partial birth abortions. Uh, and in fact, I'm against any public funding of abortions. But no, I don't believe that Roe v. Wade should be overturned. Uh, I do support um, uh, Judge Barrett. I think she's a terrific judge and she's gonna make an even better Supreme Court justice. Uh, and I fully support her uh, nomination to the Supreme Court. And I'm looking forward to that moving forward. Mr. Kim, let me ask you to, if you wanna to respond to that also. Well, look, when it comes to uh, what's gonna happen next with the Supreme Court, first and foremost, it's a, a huge problem that it's even moving forward. Just it's eroding the trust of the court. We need to make sure that we have trust and respect in our institutions and the way this is going is just about raw power. But whether it's about what Mr. Richter just said, uh, you know, for him to be able to say that he uh, doesn't want to see it overturned, but supports uh, a justice that uh, may very well do so. We also know that right on the right a few days after Election Day, the Affordable Care Act is going to be up. Uh, in front of the Supreme Court. And there's a very good chance if she is appointed to this that she will work with the others to overturn the Affordable Care Act. Millions of Americans will lose their health care. There's a lot at stake. And I think that that is the wrong direction for our country. And that is something that we should make sure uh, is known and, and, and something that we all fight to try to make sure the rest of America understands what's at stake here. Well, Mr. Richter, let me come back. Can I respond to that? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Kim called it an exercise in raw power. I mean, the reality is the president has an obligation uh, to fill Supreme Court vacancies. He's nominated Judge Barrett. Uh, I think looking at her qualifications, there's no doubt that she's qualified to serve on the Supreme Court. Uh, and the Senate is going to have to fulfill their obligation as far as um, you know, confirming or not confirming that nomination. Um, there's no doubt that uh, President Trump was elected for four years not three and a half. He's done the appropriate thing in, in nominating an outstanding judge. Uh, and now it's in front of the Senate to do, uh, to do their duty as well. There's nothing wrong with that as much as uh, some people on the left you know, want to turn this into a partisan battle. It simply isn't. So let me, let me stick with this issue a little bit more because it's, it's important. Uh, if Roe v. Wade is reverse, Mr. Richter, would you support a constitutional amendment to legalize abortion? Uh, I don't expect that Roe v. Wade is going to be overturned. Um, I don't think you can you know, predict that based upon any individual nominee. Uh, I think the court has uh, you know, respected the precedent of that case from 50 years ago. Uh, but um, you know, I would support um, uh, anything uh, that would continue uh, giving women the right to, uh, to control their own bodies um, and to have uh, you know, early term abortions. Uh, but um, there's no question that uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Mr. Congressman Kim, let me come back to you for, for that also. Well, we know that this is something that President Trump specifically said he wanted to see overturn. He said he would specifically choose uh, nominees to the court to be able to fulfill that of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. So I think Mr. Richter is is ignoring a, a huge part of this debate right now with understanding that this is exactly the intent of President Trump. And this is exactly the type of concern that women and, and all of us across this country have right now, because it is a very real and present danger uh, about what could very well happen soon. Okay, Congressman, when you campaigned for office two years ago, uh, you said you would not support Nancy Pelosi for speaker. Uh, and on your first day in Congress, you you voted for Nancy Pelosi. You made a, a different choice than what you had said as a candidate. Uh, it's now 21 months later. Uh, was the right to, was that the right move for you? Was that the right move for the third district of New Jersey? 
Well, the, the decision that I made, whether for leadership in Congress or for legislation, it always comes back to what is going to be able to deliver for the people of Burlington County and Ocean County. That's who my boss is. I serve nobody else but this district. So when I think through this, try to think about how to get the priorities that I hear from people saying, uh, we need to make sure we're low on prescription drug costs, taking climate change seriously, looking out for our small businesses. I think about who is going to be able to deliver that and how am I going to be able to work with this person and to be able to make sure that that agenda is set. So for me to be able to deliver over the last two years for passing through the house, real legislation to lower prescription drug costs, to be able to deliver for the joint military base, to be able to deliver for our veterans, to be able to make sure that we move that agenda forward for this district. I, I do think that I've been responsive to the needs and the priorities of this community. And I think that that is something that shows based on the record that I've, uh, I'm running on for reelection. Mr. Richter, would you like to respond to that? Yes, I would, David, thank you. Yeah, I, I've spent my entire life um, in the business world. I've never run for office before. This is my first campaign for public office. Uh, and one of the reasons I'm running is because I've heard a lot from politicians over my lifetime who made false promises and gave empty talk about what they were gonna do if they got elected. Uh, this is a terrific example. And you just listened to the Congressman backtrack for a minute and a half on the promise that he made to the voters that he would not support Nancy Pelosi, that he wanted new leadership in the House Democratic Caucus. Uh, and when he got down to Washington, all of a sudden his priorities changed uh, and it became something different. In his very first vote in the House, he broke a promise that he made to the voters of the third district. And I can tell you, having been on the campaign trail this entire year, uh, they remember that. Uh, he also talked about being a moderate voice for South Jersey. And Congressman Kim is very good at pretending to be a moderate Democrat when he's in New Jersey on the campaign trail. And when he's in Washington, D.C., you know, he's a member of the Progressive Caucus, which is anything but a moderate group. It's where uh, you know, AOC and the squad and Bernie Sanders hang out. Uh, that is anything but a moderate group. Uh, Congressman Kim votes with Nancy Pelosi 97% of the time. He's a rubber stamp for her agenda. Uh, he votes with AOC over 92% of the time. Uh, Congressman Kim is not a moderate, uh, and he's not someone that has kept his word to the voters of South Jersey. So, Congressman, I want to give you a, a chance to respond to that and, and also include it as, as a follow up. If if you're reelected, uh, will you vote for Nancy Pelosi again as the Democratic leader of the House? Well, as I said, I make no promises to any leadership. You know, my promises to this district, and the promise that I made to this district is looking out for their health care. It's about lowering the prescription drug costs. I want to see a new generation of leadership stepping up on both sides of the aisle. And that was a big reason why I ran for Congress to start with. And I like to keep seeing there, but when the choice is in front of me and the person that my opponent supports for speaker, Kevin McCarthy, is someone who is leading the charge and gutting pre-existing condition protections, that is something that I had to stand up against. I literally ran on this effort to make sure we're protecting people with pre-existing conditions. So I support leadership that focuses in on the issues that we're dealing with. And when that leadership is, uh, is doing something I, that I don't support, I vote against it. That's why I voted against uh, the efforts uh, in this Congress that was trying to give a, a pay raise to Congress and the uh, members of Congress. I also st tried to stop uh, an effort to try to move forward on flood insurance uh, legislation that I thought was bad for this district and stood up to uh, leadership in my party to do so. So it is about making sure we're always stepping up for this district and, and prioritizing the needs here, not just getting caught up with the partisan politics like my opponent who says that he runs with and for Donald Trump. I run for the people of Burlington County and Ocean County. Okay. Mr. Richter, let me give you another opportunity to respond on this. Yeah, I, I support President Trump. Uh, I've endorsed him and, uh, and he's endorsed me, but I'm not running for him. I'm running for the people of the third district. And I'm gonna do the best that I can in Congress to do, to take the votes uh, and take the actions and, and bring real investment back to South Jersey for their benefit. So Mr. Richter, let me, I wanna address something that it seems to make its way into most stories about you. And that is the issue of your residency. Uh, you, you have lived in the Princeton area, you moved to Cape May County to run against Congressman Andrew. Then you, you moved to Ocean County to challenge Mr. Kim. Uh, somewhere along the way, you had registered to vote in Miami. 
so my question to you is this, where do you and your family live? And if you're elected to Congress, will, will you sell your, your home in Lawrence Township to obviate any, uh, any issues pertaining to your residency? Yeah, let me, let me say this very simply. Yes, we have a home in Lawrenceville. I also have a home in the district. Um, I grew up in South Jersey. I uh, was raised in Burlington County, in Willingboro, in fact, uh, through high school. Um, later, my family moved to Cherry Hill. Uh, I have lived or worked and raised my family pretty much my entire life in South Jersey. This is, this is my home. Uh, our family business was in Burlington County uh, for more than 40 years. First in Willingboro, near where, where I grew up, and then later in Marlton. And so I've spent my entire life here. Uh, we have a home in Lawrenceville. My wife and I are preparing that home for sale. Uh, I will live in the district uh, if elected to Congress. Uh, Congressman Kim, however, spent his entire adult life outside of New Jersey. Uh, he moved to New Jersey after he announced his candidacy for Congress two years ago. Uh, he didn't spend uh, time in New Jersey between graduating high school and deciding that he wanted to replace Tom MacArthur in Congress. Uh, my story is ex the exact opposite. I'm a South Jersey guy. I've been here pretty much my entire life. And the voters know that. Okay. Congressman, let me let you respond to that. Yeah, well, look, uh, I mean, I, I couldn't have said it any better than Mr. Richter did when he literally just said that he won't move into the district until after he sees whether or not he wins this election. But look, that aside, I mean, I certainly have concerns about that because it shows a real lack of commitment to this district. But the other aspect of it is it isn't just about this residency issue. It isn't just about the fact that he ran in a different district before he ran here. But we've seen this disregard for our district throughout his career as well. When he was CEO of his family business, he was the one at the helm when he, they took a $1.7 million tax incentive to move his family business out of our district, in fact, out of our state, moving the headquarters out of state and taking over 150 jobs with them. So we have already seen him when he has the opportunity to look out for our district, grow business, be able to have support jobs here in this district. We have already seen him that $1.7 million is what it takes for him to be able to move it somewhere else. So he just doesn't have the commitment to our district and doesn't have that interest in really fighting for the people here and I think that that's what people in this district are so worried about with him. Okay, Mr. Richter, I imagine you want to respond. Um, uh, at the time, my company had an office in Marlton and an office in Philadelphia, and we simply consolidated them. Uh, every single job in Marlton continued in Philadelphia, not a single job was lost. Uh, but the reality is New Jersey has made it very difficult to do business here. Uh, and uh, Congressman Kim works very closely with Governor Murphy, who's raising taxes. He just instituted a uh, millionaire's tax that's gonna drive more hiring professionals out of New Jersey into Pennsylvania and Delaware and Florida. Uh, the business climate in New Jersey, I believe last time I checked, ranked dead last in the country. Uh, New Jersey doesn't want businesses here and they make it very hostile to, uh, to run a business. Uh, the taxes are absurd. The regulation is absurd. Uh, you know, as one good example, Congressman Kim voted to raise the, uh, the minimum wage uh, during this term. Uh, the third district is full of small and family owned businesses that have been struggling the last six months. And the last thing they need is higher taxes, higher labor costs, more regulation. Uh, Congressman Kim supports a 20% increase in the payroll tax. That's not going to help business in New Jersey. It's not going to help businesses anywhere. Uh, but the fact is that uh, he's never run a business. He doesn't know the challenges that business people face in trying to stay alive, in trying to make a profit, in trying to keep their employees employed and working and satisfy their customers. He only views the world through a, a government lens. Uh, but the businesses I've talked to in South Jersey, and I've talked to a lot of business people, uh, they need relief from what New Jersey is doing to them. And by New Jersey, I mean the Democrats in New Jersey. Okay, thank you. And Congressman, the Republican Jewish Coalition is spending $500,000 on a TV ad uh, alleging that while you were working in the White House, uh, they say you gave bad advice to President Obama that allowed ISIS to take over Iraq. Now, the ad says that your advice allowed Iraq to build its caliphate. Is, is that criticism of your record fair? Not at all. It just uh, lies and lies and lies. 
and just trying to find something that will stick. I mean, look, I find it to be so offensive that just we continue to see attacks on public servants. For me, as someone who worked under both Republicans and Democrats before, volunteered to go to Afghanistan to be able to serve alongside our military there, fighting on counterterrorism issues constantly to try to keep our homeland safe. I find it offensive to go after public servants, to go after our military, to go after others who are trying to keep us safe. I have dedicated my career to trying to, uh, to ensure our national security. I have lost people that I know to ISIS. And for this type of effort to try to smear me and my career, uh, I find to be uh, offensive and, and repugnant. So this is something that uh, is absolutely a lie. Uh, and they're just, look, they're very desperate to try to find some way to tarnish my reputation. I'm sad that it comes to that in terms of politics. Mr. Richter. Uh, Mr. Kim's claim to fame when he ran for Congress was his experience in the Obama White House uh, as a, uh, a staff member on the National Security Council. Yet he is tied directly to the two biggest foreign policy failures of the Obama administration. The first was the rise of ISIS, which took over large chunks of, uh, of Iraq uh, and Syria, tortured, raped, and killed thousands and thousands of people. Uh, and yet when Obama was asked about ISIS, he claimed they were the JV team. He wasn't worried about them at all. Uh, and that falls squarely on Mr. Kim. He also said after the fact that it was an intelligence failure on the part of his staff. Uh, ISIS wasn't really on their radar screen. Uh, again, uh, as the director of, uh, of Iraq for the National Security Council, uh, Mr. Kim has to take responsibility. Now he can say he wasn't responsible. He was just a junior staffer and he's not responsible for the, the actions uh, President Obama took. Uh, but that's not what we've heard on the campaign trail. Uh, secondly, the other failure was the uh, disastrous uh, Iran nuclear deal. Uh, we paid billions and billions and billions of dollars to a nation uh, that's the largest state sponsor of terrorism in the world. Uh, they didn't, we did not stop them from developing uh, you know, nuclear weapons. That, that program is still advancing. Uh, and yet we, we transferred a ton of money and that money went to uh, fund terrorism throughout the Middle East. Uh, President Trump rightly uh, withdrew from that deal, uh, canceled it. And, uh, you know, for Congressman Kim now to claim that attacks on his record while in the White House are somehow unfair or, or offensive is, uh, is ridiculous. Okay. Congressman, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, well, it's, it's, uh, it's unfair and offensive because you don't understand what you're talking about. You don't seem to understand how national security works. If you ever had the chance to work in or visit Iraq or Afghanistan, maybe you'd understand what is at stake and why me and many other people who risked our lives for this country find these comments to be offensive. And so I just ask you to just take a little bit of time to just imagine what it's like to put yourself at risk on behalf of this country, to swear that oath to the constitution, and be able to say that uh, we are putting everything on the line. You no, know, so th that's why I just find it so offensive that Mr. Uh, President Trump and others continue to denigrate public servants that are just trying to serve our nation. We know that foreign policy successes and failures hinge on not any individual, not even just the president. And we need to make sure that we are working together as a team rather than just trying to, to divide us and, and, and just try to smear what it means to serve this nation. I take pride in my career. I take pride in working under Republicans and Democrats and, and serving in the way that I did. And maybe if you had a chance to do it at some point in your career, you would understand what I'm talking about. Okay. And Mr. Richard, so I'm working very hard to have that chance in my career to serve my country. And neither I nor anybody else that I've heard has denigrated your career in government, but you are responsible for the decisions you made and the judgment calls you made or didn't make uh, that led to some pretty terrible things under the Obama administration. And the rise of ISIS is, is top of the list. Okay. Now, Mr. Richter, you tout your, your private sector experience, your CAEO experience as your qualification for Congress. And you, you, you spoke earlier of the, the growth that Hill International had under your leadership. Uh, the New Jersey Globe and others uh, have reported that on on your watch, uh, your company lost more than $10 million during your final year as CEO and that your company paid a half a million dollar fine to the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, so my question, Mr. Richter, is, is why did 
your board of directors remove you as the chief executive officer of Hill International? Uh, it was, first of all, a mutual decision. When I joined Hill, uh, the company was doing about $20 million a year in revenue. Uh, it was on the verge of bankruptcy. And I came back to, to South Jersey to, to try and turn the business around because a lot of people in my family and a lot of people that worked for the company, their lives uh, depended upon that. And we worked hard, we turned the business around. Uh, we grew it dramatically. Uh, we were fortunate we were able to take the company public. About 10 years after I joined it, I led that effort. Uh, and we grew the business from 300 employees to 4,300 employees. Uh, and the year I left as CEO, the company had grown from 20 million in revenue to $500 million in revenue. Uh, Hill was a tremendous success story. And we created a company that was one of the best firms in the world at doing what we did. And what we did was not easy. You're talking about managing complex, uh, multi-billion dollar projects, construction projects around the world. Uh, many, you know, in the Middle East and in Asia and, and Latin America and Europe. Um, I'm proud of my track record in building Hill. Uh, but going public is one of those things, be careful what you wish for. We had some activist shareholders come in uh, and take control of the board. And what they wanted to do was slash and burn the company and, and prepare it for sale. Uh, and I didn't want to do that. I wanted to continue to build the company, uh, continue to grow it. And, uh, and we had difficulty working together. So I left, I left in 2017. Okay. And uh, yeah, go ahead, David. Mr. Kim, would you, uh, Congressman Kim, would you like to respond to that? Well, I, I think one big piece that he's missing from his description of his business and his time at the helm is about the $500,000 that you mentioned, Mr. Wildstein, about how his company under his watch was fined $500,000 for accounting fraud, for keeping information about millions of dollars of losses away from, uh, from shareholders, from investors. I find that to be unbelievable. And I know that he has said before, this is someone under me. It wasn't my decision. It wasn't something like that. But look, you know, we know that he was the president and CEO of the company. In fact, I looked it up. His name, his signature is there, accounting for uh, every single dollar, saying that I've reviewed our accounting of our company. So it falls squarely on his shoulders here. And that's something that he continues to avoid talking about. But look, I mean, how many business owners here in this district, how many people watching have businesses? How many of you have been uh, fined half a million dollars by the United States government for accounting fraud? This is not normal. And it is indicative of poor leadership uh, at the helm. Uh, once again, the congressman doesn't know what he's talking about because it wasn't accounting fraud. There was no fraud at Hill. From the moment I joined it until I left it, there was never any, any evidence of fraud and no fraud ever occurred. And the fact is when you build a business uh, like I did, uh, integrity is very important. And that's one of my core values, integrity and honesty. Uh, and I don't like having my integrity questioned. Um, there was a fine pay, it was not for fraud. Uh, and it didn't relate to me, it related to two uh, accountants in our finance department. Um, I was not part of that. There was no indication I was part of it. I paid no fine. Uh, and the fact is that um, you know, the company did a lot of things right for decades. And uh, you know, one small issue uh, is to highlight is uh, not indicative of my 22 years of leadership at the company. So, so I've watched both of your campaigns very closely. Uh, one of the things that's been absolutely clear to me uh, is something that the two of you have in common, and that is that you you both adore your children. Uh, and I've I've seen it in your I've seen it in your ads, and I've seen it in your videos. And Andy, your two sons, and David, your your four daughters, I see how they, they look at you. Uh, so my question is, is this, and I'll ask Mr. Richter this first. Uh, what would you say to your opponent's child if they approached you and asked you directly, why do you say such bad things about my father? Well, that's a great question to ask because, uh, and I'm not sure whether you know this, my campaign is running a 100% positive campaign about me and my qualifications for Congress and what I intend to do when I get there. Uh, you have not seen a uh, Richter for Congress campaign ad that attacks Andy Kim in any way. Uh, and that's a big part of what, uh, what I'm running on. The fact is we're in the middle of a debate and this is our opportunity to, to question each other and challenge each other on the issues. Uh, you've seen the exact opposite campaign for Andy. 
I've had people on the campaign trail constantly ask me, I'm, I'm getting so much junk mail from the uh, Kim campaign. It's all negative. It's all attacks on you. Are these attacks true? And I say they're not true. They're misrepresentations and half-truths and lies. Um, you see the same thing in his TV commercials. He's spending an inordinate amount of money doing everything he can to trash me because he can't defend his own record. Why? Because he doesn't have any accomplishments in Congress. He talks a lot about the, uh, you know, the campaign, the um, committees he sits on and the bills he's co-sponsored and the town halls he's had. These aren't accomplishments. This is the, the bare minimum job, uh, job description requirements. If you take a look at what he's accomplished in Congress, uh, the, the resume is very thin because the results just aren't there. At the end of the day, you know, the, the citizens of the third district care about the results that we bring home for them. What are we accomplishing in Congress for their benefit? And I can tell you, I talked to a lot of people on the campaign trail. They, they don't see what Congressman Kim has done for them. He sits on the coronavirus committee uh, and we're in the middle of this terrible disaster. You've got Nancy Pelosi playing politics with the latest round of, uh, of uh, COVID relief, uh, not compromising with the uh, Republicans who want to deliver it, while she has a, you know, a Chris Christmas wish list of, of goodies that they want in there uh, that are not directly tied to COVID, uh, that are you know, blue state uh, bailouts, okay. uh, money in there for uh, illegal aliens than, uh, uh, than anybody else. And uh, I think that's, that's very disappointing. And, uh, and the one playing politics without question is, uh, is Congressman Kemp. Okay, so Congressman, it's, it's the same question. If, if one of Mr. Richter's daughters approached you and said, why are you saying these things about my father? What would you, what would you say to her? Yeah, well, look, uh, I'll start by saying, I don't know how my five-year-old would feel about what Mr. Richter just said, but look, coming back at it, what I would say is I have a deep respect for your father that he stepped up to run, I do. I know I have a lot of disagreements with him but I do respect people who throw their hat into the arena. Um, it, it's, it's a tough, tough place to put yourself in public and to try to ask your fellow neighbor for their support. But I would also go on and say that I do have dis, uh, deep disagreements about the vision for our country and that's what this is about. I believe that both my opponent and I uh, love our family, we love our community. Um, Mr. Richter is absolutely right, he did grow up here in this district. In fact, we went to the same high school. Um, I don't question his love for New Jersey, um, but I think we have very different visions for what kind of New Jersey, what kind of country we want our children to grow up in. So, you know, when all said and done, um, I have an enormous amount of respect for Mr. Richter, um, and I'm, I'm sure he does uh, to me, and uh, I hope that we can continue to focus in on these issues uh, and try to just make sure we present to the people of this district that uh, we do not want to reflect the deep divisiveness in our country. Instead, want to show that there's a better way to be able to do this. So those are some of the thoughts that I have to share right now. Okay, thank you. And at this point in the debate, it's time for each candidate to have an opportunity to ask one question of their opponent. Uh, to remind you, you'll have 30 seconds to ask the question and your opponent will have one minute to respond. Uh, and then you'll have uh, 30 seconds, if you wish, to, to offer rebuttal. So uh, Congressman Kim will ask you to go first and ask a question of Mr. Richter. Yeah, happy to. Um, Mr. Richter, when we got together last time around on a forum, we talked about the coronavirus crisis, you reaffirmed a statement you had said before that, the, that you believe the worst is behind us that we should open up uh, everything in our, uh, in our state, all the businesses, all the other aspects of our state. I see you on Facebook taking pictures uh, with other people not wearing a mask. You're oftentimes even indoors for fundraisers and other events with people. I wanna see our state open up. I wanna get us back going, but I also have deep concerns and a serious concern about the state of this virus. Based on what we saw with the president uh, getting tested positive now, that the White House, the most protected building in this country has now been the site of an outbreak. I wanted to just ask you, and I know you answered this kind of in the first question, but you evaded the question, but I wanted to just ask you, do you still stand by your positions? Do you, do you really believe that, uh, that we should be opening up and that we should be moving that direction? Or 
will you just confirm with us that you've been on the wrong path when it comes to the virus and that we should be social distancing, wearing a mask and not following what I believe is your poor example? Uh, yeah, let me, let me answer that. Uh, and, and thank you for that question because it's an important one. Um, your, your summary of what I've said on the, on the record is, is not entirely accurate. Um, you know, I was operating off of the uh, data, uh, which I tracked pretty closely, that came from the state of New Jersey, uh, that showed the, uh, the curve had uh, you know, not only been flattened, but had come down dramatically as of the beginning of June. And so for the last over four months, uh, the infection rate in New Jersey has been very, very small. Now, we expected that to go up in the fall uh, as students went back to school, uh, as businesses started to reopen, as we had uh, you know, indoor dining again, uh, even at 25% capacity. Uh, and I don't believe that the, the virus is behind us uh, by any means. Uh, people will continue to get sick and uh, unfortunately people will, will continue to die. Uh, the virus is not going away uh, anytime soon. But I think we've done an effective job of bringing it uh, to, to under control. But I think we need to continue those things. We need to continue wearing masks, especially for people that are either ill or are at high risk of getting ill. We need to continue social distancing. What I said was that we need to bring uh, the economy back. We cannot keep it under lockdown for six, nine, 12 months. Uh, businesses won't survive that long. Families won't survive that long. So we need to bring the businesses back. We need to bring the jobs back but we need to do it carefully and safely, safely to make sure that the impact from, the, uh, from COVID is as minimal as possible. Okay, Congressman, would you like to respond to that? Well, I just still disagree with the example that Mr. Richter is setting. Um, you know, taking these photos without wearing a mask, I really think it sends the, the wrong message at a time where I'm still very concerned about what happens next. Today, uh, the reports coming in from our state is that Ocean County is nearly a quarter of all positive cases in the state of New Jersey. We're seeing increases. I'm worried about a second wave. I hope it doesn't happen. And I share with Mr. Rector the desire to get businesses back up and running, which is why I supported the HEROES Act and trying to get hundreds of millions of dollars back into this district. But my opponent opposes getting federal resources into our state. And I think that, again, these are just indicative of just the wrong decisions at the at at this exact time of need in our state. Okay, and Mr. Richter, I wanna give you an opportunity to ask Congressman Kim a question. And Mr. Richter, I'd, I'd like to just give you an opportunity to ask Congressman Kim uh, a question from you. Yes, thank you, David. Uh, Congressman, the last time we were in a debate forum together, um, we were talking about the Progressive Caucus. Uh, and I was talking about uh, positions that they are proposing and advancing, uh, such as the Green New Deal and Medicare for All. Uh, and you uh, did a very good job, at least, or at least trying to, backtrack away from positions uh, that you said didn't represent uh, your own personal viewpoint. Uh, I called on you at that time to, uh, uh, if that was correct and true, to step aside from the Progressive Caucus to resign. Uh, that's been about two weeks, you haven't done so. Uh, so let me ask you a question. Why do you belong to a group uh, that you don't agree with on principle uh, or philosophy? Uh, but if you do, uh, you know, feel free to continue to be a member. But if you don't, I call on you once again to step aside from the Progressive Caucus. It doesn't represent the values of South Jersey. Uh, it's a radical uh, liberal group. Uh, and I'd like you to explain to, to me and the voters why, if you want to stay a member, why that's your choice. Congressman? Yeah. Yeah, happy to respond. I am a member of 37 different caucuses in Congress, each one trying to get at different issues related to this community. I'm on the bipartisan opioid task force because of the importance of these issues. I, I'm on the armed services caucus. With the progressive caucus, it's the caucus that is focusing on campaign finance reform. And it is where I try to work to address these issues I hear from both Republicans and Democrats. Over 30 of the caucuses that I think am in, I think I'm 34 of the 37 are bipartisan caucuses. I'm in 13 caucuses with Congressman Chris Smith, Republican neighboring congressman of mine. So in these caucuses, it's about building coalitions. It's about trying to engage with people across the political ideological spectrum. Sometimes they're very liberal, sometimes they're very conservative, but I still need to be able to work with them. And it's about building those types of coalitions to try to get things done. Do I agree with them on 100% of everything? Of course not. 
the, this district knows that I fight for this district and that the issues and policies are not dictated by any single caucus or any single membership. But that is something that uh, tries to get at the core of what I'm trying to do, which is trying to be a bridge here in Congress, trying to bring people together, talk to people I may have disagreements with, rather than uh, just trying to isolate and surround myself uh, with only the people that have uh, the most in common with me. I'm trying to go out there and engage with others. So that is what I'm trying to do. And that is why I continue to do the work that I do. Mr. Richter, let me give you 30 seconds to respond to that. Yeah, of course, thank you. Um, if you're trying to claim that you're a bipartisan member of Congress, the Progressive Caucus is a strange group to be a part of. Uh, as I said, uh, it was co-founded by Bernie Sanders, uh, AOC and Ilan Omar. Uh, and the rest of the squad are members. Uh, they are probably the least bipartisan members in the entire Congress. But the Progressive Caucus is such a radical leftist group uh, that 60% of the members of the Democratic members of the House refuse to join it. And 100% of the Democratic senators uh, refuse to join it. Bernie Sanders is the only member of the United States Senate uh, that's a member of the caucus. Um, if you want to take bipartisan action, uh, that's a strange place to do it. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go back to some questions now. Congressman, the the joint base, uh, McGuire, Fort Dix, Lakehurst, monumentally important military installation uh, that, that, that largely sits in your congressional district. You're on the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, some Republicans have said that you have not been forceful enough in advocating for the uh, joint base. Are, are you the best candidate going forward to protect the joint base as a economic engine for your district? Absolutely. Uh, I absolutely have been fighting hard for this joint base. Being on the Armed Services Committee, trying to make sure we're bringing millions of dollars back into this district to be able to support that joint base, be able to continue on the mission of my predecessors to be able to get the KC-46 Pegasus uh, on the ground as soon as possible, looking out for our service members. I visited Afghanistan to be able to meet with some of our service members from the joint base that are serving over there. Uh, as someone who worked in national security my whole career, worked at the Pentagon, lived on a military base uh, in Afghanistan, uh, I know how to be able to navigate this and be a forceful advocate uh, for this joint base. Um, it's to make sure that we keep the jobs here make sure that we can grow the innovation, the industry, and uh, just making sure that we can really solidify the ties between our community and the base. I feel like we've made a lot of good progress and we're gonna be able to do a lot more going forward. Okay, Mr. Richter, would you like to respond? Yeah, if he's made any progress, uh, the voters don't know about it. I mean, the fact is the KC-46 was brought in to the joint base by his predecessor, Congressman MacArthur. Uh, there was an Army Corps that was recently making a decision about where to locate. Um, in the uh, northeastern United States. Uh, the joint base was on the short list, but at the end of the day, they chose to go elsewhere. Uh, and after the fact, the congressman sent a, uh, a very strongly worded letter complaining about the decision, but he couldn't get it done. And it's not about sending strongly worded letters. It's about being part of the process and making sure the right decision is made, the right decision for your district. The same thing happened with the, uh, with the VA recently. Uh, the VA was planning on building a new veterans health clinic in Ocean County. Uh, that project was recently canceled. And again, from Congressman Kim's office uh, came another strongly worded letter complaining about the decision. But the fact is he didn't get it done beforehand. And if you're not gonna be part of the process, if you're not gonna make sure that the right decision gets made for your district, then all the rhetoric in the world isn't gonna make up for those poor results. Okay, and Congressman, let me give you a chance to respond to that. Yeah, it's just another example of my uh, opponent just not understanding how this process works. And whether it's with supporting our veterans, I think the veterans in this district have seen the work that I try to do. But when it comes to uh, trying to make sure we're holding the VA accountable, they know that that is something that's been a long time of a problem. And this is why I continue to push for having that new clinic uh, in Ocean County. It doesn't fall on any single person uh, that it didn't keep up with the timeline. And we are making sure that we're pushing for when it comes to uh, the Army Corps that he was just talking about. My job is to support the commander at the base and the, and, the, and the effort that they're making to try to push that forward. I would not want to overstep in those types of ways. It's about respecting the service members and respecting that chain of command that they are going through. And again, my opponent just doesn't understand 
what uh, it takes to be able to work with our commander at the base and with others to be able to make sure that we are working together in sync to look out for our district. But I've been able to do a lot to make sure that we're bringing new missions to the joint base. And it's not just about you know, what's happening today or tomorrow or next year, but it's about making sure that this base continues to be a vibrant part of our community for decades to come. And laying that vision is something that's very important. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Richter, healthcare is an, an extraordinarily important issue facing your district, your state, your country. Uh, some might argue that Congressman Kim would not have won the last election if it weren't for differences on the health care issue. Uh, do you support the repeal of the Affordable Care Act? And, and if so, what alternative? And are you willing to guarantee the people of the third district that you would never uh, vote to deny uh, health care to people with pre-existing conditions? Yes, absolutely, David. Uh, you know, when I was running a company, we provided the best possible health care to our employees. It was very important for us to attract the best and the brightest. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that they had uh, the absolute best health care possible for them uh, and for their families. Uh, in fact, when the cost of prescription drugs uh, grew so high, we put in place a self-insurance plan to make sure that our employees didn't have to go out of pocket for prescription drugs. Um, I care very deeply about uh, you know, everyone having access to the best possible health care. Uh, contrary to what Mr. Kim has said on the campaign trail, I do not support repealing Obamacare. Uh, I support reforms to it uh, and improvements to it, uh, but I do not support repeal. And I absolutely have said, uh, and again, my, my opponent likes to say the opposite, but I absolutely will, will protect uh, those with pre-existing conditions from ever losing their health care. And I make that promise and pledge tonight. Okay, Congressman? Let's, look, that's easy to say, but when we see that my opponent supported the 2017 effort that the Trump administration led that was about gutting uh, the Affordable Care Act and gutting protections for people with pre-existing conditions, that we know that right now we have seen during this pandemic over 5 million Americans lose their health care. And this administration continues this effort to try to put before the Supreme Court a case that would completely reverse and, and gut the Affordable Care Act that would potentially put another 20 million plus Americans out of health insurance during the middle of a pandemic. So I, I'm glad that my opponent has, has reversed the way he talks about this, but uh, it, it's again just in words when he is supporting a president that has made it his mission to repeal the Affordable Care Act and has actually put forward legislation passed through the House nearly passed through the Senate that would have gutted pre-existing condition protections. And, and that is what we just understand as the, again, the conflicting visions for our district and for our country. We are just fundamentally opposed on that issue. Okay. David, 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 as I said before, integrity is very important to me. I wish it was as important to the Congressman because I have never once said that I'm in favor of repealing Obamacare. I have never once said I'm uh, not in support of protecting people with pre-existing conditions. He keeps making that up uh, and trying to uh, put words in my mouth that have never, ever been there. Uh, but the fact is, he's a member of a, the Progressive Caucus that's advocating for a, a $33 trillion Medicare for All plan. He may want to backtrack from that as well and claim that he doesn't support that. But that's a program that would uh, you know, destroy the American healthcare system. It would put every private insurer uh, right into bankruptcy. It would cost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of jobs. It would deny uh, you know, every employee that has a company paid health insurance plan uh, far superior quality like the plan that Hillary Nash offered when I ran the company uh, for its employees and force them onto a government uh, paid uh, healthcare program that's higher cost and lower quality. Uh, and there's no question that the voters in the third district do not support Medicare for all. Okay. And Congressman, I want to I want to talk about a, a local issue that that has federal implications. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, Karen Wall at the Patch reported that the U.S. Department of Justice believes that Tom's River, that's the largest municipality in your district, uh, might have violated the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. I, I think it's called uh, RELOPA. Uh, in regards to the limitation of the development along the Lakewood corridor. 
Uh, Congressman, should the federal government be involved in local zoning issues uh, when it involves religious freedoms? Well, that's, that's something that we're, we're still digging into here. I mean, we knew, we've been working and I've been trying to help bridge uh, you know, the community and trying to foster those ties, make sure that they're talking to each other, but no doubt that there have been a lot of tensions there. So, you know, I don't think it's a, it's a place right now for federal intervention. I think right now we're trying to do everything we can to be able to uh, settle this at the community level and try to come up with a plan on how we can make sure that we can have a community that is built on respect, making sure that we can protect, uh, you know, all across the, the community and making sure that it doesn't become something that is as divisive as, as it could be going forward. So I'm hoping that this is something that gets smoothed out sooner rather than later. Okay, Mr. Richter. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a strong defender of religious liberty and religious freedom. Uh, and when certain actions are taken, uh, and, and keep in mind, anti-Semitism, you know, is is such an evil uh, that people don't always uh, you know, uh, brag about it. They 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 implement anti-Semitism in very subtle ways. Uh, and there's no question that the zoning code can be used as as one of those uh, quiet weapons. Uh, and when it is used to, to sort of block in and prevent the, the growth and expansion of a religious minority um, like the Jewish community in Ocean County, uh, there's no question that uh, you know, the federal government should step in. Um, I don't think it should be necessary. I wish it weren't necessary. Uh, but when it is, they should step in to make sure that people's constitutional uh, rights to freedom of religion um, are, uh, are not impinged upon. Okay, and this... I had said we won't start anything uh, after after nine fifty six, but I, I hope you'll you'll indulge me because you know we we can't we can't have a meaningful debate uh, for the United States House of Representatives without without really talking about jobs and about the struggles of small businesses in your district uh, as a result of the, the 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 global pandemic. I mean, your district and the state is facing enormous unemployment. So, so let me ask us the, first, the last question before we go to closing statements for, for each of you, and we'll start with Congressman Kim. Uh, what's your plan going forward? What's your plan for the next Congress uh, to, to help small businesses survive and to create jobs for people who live in your district? Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm glad we can end on this uh, important topic because it's really been at the forefront of my mind uh, as the only member of Congress from New Jersey on the Small Business Committee, I've really made it a mission of mine uh, to really make sure that we are helping in every way we can. We know that this is such a tough time. I've been going around to visit and listen to business owners all across the district. I remember when I went out to Rainbow Diner in Brick, and the owner telling me just about the struggles that they're having. They're worried about the cold season coming in, not being able to have as much uh, outdoor dining to be able to help get them through. Um, you know, these are the types of issues that we really need to make sure we're addressing. What we're trying to do is make sure we can deliver another round of the Paycheck Protection Program. This is something that we worked on in a bipartisan way before, and hopefully we'll be able to do again. I think there's a, a lot of agreement on this. We're just trying to nail that down, the, the details of this. But that type of effort uh, is, is so critically important to just try to get businesses through this time. I've supported a number of other efforts and wrote legislation to try to help small businesses through these particularly tough times. So that is something that I'm committed to, um, making sure that we can continue to move forward. And hey, Mr. Richter? Uh, I'm glad to hear that he supports the Paycheck Protection Program. I think that's been a, a terrific program. I think we should you know, move forth another round of that uh, to protect uh, you know, jobs, uh, particularly at small businesses. Uh, I'm kind of disheartened. Uh, that the Democrats in the House are, are staying in the way of uh, getting that approved uh, and implemented for the benefit of the businesses uh, in South Jersey, uh, while they try to sort of pack in a whole bunch of things that have nothing to do with COVID uh, into uh, the next round of, uh, of stimulus. Um, this is a great example. You know, I, I created thousands of jobs in the private sector. Uh, and I've talked to a lot of business people uh, as I've campaigned this year. Uh, and it's a, uh, you know, it's a very difficult situation. The economy roared back uh, under President Trump. Uh, there's no question that the uh, tax cuts in 2017 helped uh, prime the economy uh, and got us to a very strong position 
right up until the pandemic sort of took the wind out of all of our sails. But we can, we can build it back. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I want to go to Congress, because it's critically important that we re rebuild the economy. And I've got the, the skills and experience uh, to do exactly that. Uh, we hear a lot from Democrats about how important jobs is, but the policies that they implement, higher taxes, higher regulation, uh, don't help job creation. They just don't. Uh, and jobs are my number one priority in Congress. Okay, and Congressman, I gave Mr. Richter a couple extra uh, seconds there, so let me let me give you another crack at this. Well, look, uh, this is something that um, uh, we know how tough of the times. I remember hearing a line that you know during economic t difficulties, you know, small businesses are always the first to get hit and the last to recover. And what I heard this time around, a lot of small businesses saying they're not sure they're going to be able to recover. Um, and that's you know breaking my heart and something that you know all of us um, need to make sure we're working on that we're committed to doing this in a bipartisan way. Um, that is my commitment to the small business owners in this district that I'll keep fighting for them and have that tangible impact that, uh, that'll hopefully help them get through these tough times. Okay, thank you. So now it's time for closing statements. Uh, Mr. Richter, we'll, we'll start with you, 90 seconds to, uh, to end the debate. Thank you, David. And, and thank you again for hosting this, this forum. I think it's critically important uh, that we talk to the voters about the issues that uh, we care about. And I think for those that have been paying attention the entire night, it's crystal clear uh, the differences between my opponent and myself. Uh, Congressman Kim came in misrepresenting what he was going to do in Congress uh, and what he was going to try to accomplish. Uh, as we heard him say, he pledged to not vote for Nancy Pelosi. And then for a whole sort of bunch of reasons, he changed his mind when he got there. And he voted for Nancy Pelosi uh, as Speaker of the House. Uh, he promised to be a moderate voice uh, for the people of South Jersey. Uh, and yet his record in Congress doesn't reflect that. As a member of the Progressive Caucus, which advocates for the $90 trillion Green New Deal, which advocates for the $33 trillion uh, Medicare for All plan, and a whole bunch of other policies that don't reflect the true values of, uh, of South Jersey voters. Uh, he votes with Nancy Pelosi 97% of the time. And he may talk about uh, using his best judgment to decide what to support and what not to support. But the reality is for the past two years, he's been a rubber stamp for Nancy Pelosi and her leftist agenda. Uh, and that's not doing the best for the voters of South Jersey. Now, he wants to raise taxes. He supported $19 trillion in additional taxes uh, on families, working families and small businesses. Uh, that's not gonna help them create more jobs. Uh, and neither is a 20% increase in the payroll tax, which he's advocated for. Um, I came out of the private sector. I understand what it, what it takes to turn around a business and create jobs. And I think I can help turn around the economy uh, as a member of Congress. Uh, as I said from the very beginning, South Jersey is my home. This is where my family is. This is where my daughters are being raised. I care very much about the future uh, of my country and my state for my family. And I care about it for your family as well. And I hope if you send me to Congress, um, I will do everything I can to not let you down and support uh, the people of South Jersey uh, as a member of the House. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Congressman Kim, we'll go to you for your closing statement. Well, thank you again for pulling us together for this debate. Good to see you again, Mr. Rector. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, again. You've heard a lot from my opponent tonight trying to cast me in this light or that light. But what I ask of you is to look at the work that I've done. Look at what I've tried to get done for this district, the commitment that I've shown, not just what other people say. I'm running for re-election because you and your family deserve someone that is fighting for you, someone you can trust, someone who's gonna work hard to be able to deliver for Burlington County and Ocean County. It's that spirit of service that has guided me over my entire career, whether it was me working at the Pentagon, or at the State Department volunteering to go to Afghanistan, working at the White House, stepping up to run for Congress. It's always been about the country, always been about our community. I believe that when you love a place, you fight for it. You do everything you can. You try to make sure that you give everything 110% to get through it, but you gotta also do it with honor and integrity. I have to tell you, there's not a day that goes by where I don't recognize that I have the opportunity to work a job whose job description is written in the Constitution of the United States. And that is a deeply humbling experience. 
as a son of immigrants, married to an immigrant, as someone who did my whole kindergarten through 12 in the public school systems right here in this community, that is deeply humbling. What I want to do is be able to continue my career in service, making sure that we can do our best for this country, to be able to bridge us at a time of great divide, to try to heal the divisions that are out there. I hope you've seen that in the first two years, and I ask humbly for your vote again. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. And that brings the New Jersey Globe third district congressional debate uh, between Andy Kim, Democratic incumbent, and David Richter, the Republican challenger, brings it to a close. Uh, I hope everybody will stay around for a post-debate analysis uh, with two state assembly members from Burlington County, uh, Democrat Carol Murphy and Republican Ryan Peters, along with two uh, well-known political strategists, Steve Askew, a Democrat, and Art Gallagher, a Republican. Uh, the New Jersey Globe will be back next Sunday evening, uh, October 11th, with a debate between Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill and her Republican challenger, Rosemary Becky. And then uh, two weeks after that, Congressman Josh Gottheimer and his Republican opponent, Frank Pallotta. So I, I thank you both very much, Congressman Kim, Mr. Richter. Thank you for participating in, in this lively discussion. I wish you uh, both the very best of luck and, and hope that you both stay safe and that you're both well and your families are well. Thank you, David, same to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, thanks. And now we're going to move uh, toward the uh, the next portion of our uh, uh, and and Congressman, Mr. Richter, I'm, you're you're free to stay. Uh, it's a Zoom call. It's not high tech. You're you're free to to stay and listen. But I, I I won't ask you to participate, and we won't extend the debate any any further than you already have. But uh, uh, we're going to start, and I'm going to uh, uh, bring our panelists in. We won't extend the debate any any further than no. we already have. But uh, uh, we're going to start. Welcome, everybody. I just want to uh, let Assemblywoman Murphy in. Yeah. And, uh, and Art Gallagher. Hello, everybody. How are you? Great, you? How are you? Doing, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Uh, I've been waiting an hour to say that I... I never put my jacket on for this debate. It's like a little embarrassing. It's it's right behind me. I thought I'd put it on a couple minutes before, and I forgot. I forgot. But but hopefully uh, hopefully I wasn't Chris Wallace. Hopefully I had other you know the New Jersey Globe debate had had other high qualities to it. Uh, did much better than Chris Wallace. Thank you, thank you. And uh, let me start. I mean, we'll we'll go through. But but Assemblywoman Murphy, uh, who won the debate tonight? Well, you know, um, I, I, I'm leaning towards um, Andy Kim here. Um, Andy Kim had come back with answers that, look, we know Andy Kim has proven his record that he is out there supporting the people. He says nothing that he hasn't done, at least when and he's in the districts and he's talking to people. So, you know, I think, I think Andy Kim has shown that he... He, he needs to be in the Congress. We depend on Andy Kim to be in Congress. And um, I, you know, I tend to believe that when people look at this debate and they watch it tonight and maybe they'll see it, you know, after on your reruns that you have on Globe. Um, I think we're also gonna come out with the fact that, you know, Andy Kim stood by what he's been, what he's been talking about for the last two years. And, you know, um, I think he's a, a good, strong support mechanism that we need in the Democratic Party in Congress. Okay, and Assemblyman Peters, who do you think won? Uh, well, I, I think the people of the uh, of CD3 definitely won. I think that was a very civil, uh, good debate that uh, you know went through policy and, and ideas and not just ad hominem attacks. So I think um, uh, that was the clear winner. Second is, is obviously David Richter. I think the biggest issue I saw um, Congressman Kim mentioned trust in the first four seconds. And uh, later, it was brought up uh, the Speaker Pelosi issue, which has been nagging him for two years of you know swearing up and down he wouldn't vote for her. And it was actually the first vote he ever took in Congress was to vote for Nancy Pelosi. And he had two opportunities to respond and say why he did it. 
And there were two non-answers. One was, well, I'll, I'll do what, what's good for my district. And the second one was the uh, Affordable Care Act is helpful. So um, I, I think talking about trust and then saying your first vote was one that um, was, set, was one you wouldn't make, I think struggled. Uh, and I think really stood out uh, throughout the debate as far as something for him. So, um, and then I think a little weak on the jobs. Um, his coronavirus questions were commingled the safety protocols and the fact that we need to be open. I think he, he tried to correct that later and say, hey, small businesses need to come back. But I um, mean, he had one question and it was of David Richter and, hey, you know, what do you, should we shut this economy down essentially? Um, but then later corrected and said, we should keep small businesses open. So I think jobs and trust are two things that stood out and uh, David Richter clearly had the upper hand. The next two guys on this panel, for people who don't know, they are they are extraordinarily shy individuals. So, so I'm going to try my very best to to get Steve and Art to uh, uh, draw them out of their shell and, and talk about it. Steve, how did how did Congressman Kim and and Mr. Richter do? Well, I think Congressman Kim showed a lot of passion tonight. Um, he was spot on and and on point. Um, Whereas uh, David Richter sounded like a drone, another Trumper who's just going to be a rubber stamp for Donald Trump. They made it clear in the first debate with the Chamber of Commerce of South Jersey that he was running, you know, to be a Trump advocate in Congress. And, you know, so I, it's, it's kind of odd, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure Ryan Peters doesn't agree with this, perhaps maybe he does, that, you know, they want to, he, he wants to do away with masks. He wants to reopen everything right now, straight, straight, full speed ahead. And, you know, we're not at that stage right now. We have a president who is out of control uh, with his behavior and not leading by example. And so I, I think David Richter failed big time on that question tonight. Art, how do you, how do you think they did? Well, David, first, uh, I want to, I think they, they both did okay, but, I, but you really did great. And you are doing great for the people of New Jersey, filling a big void uh, that the mainstream uh, media has. And I've been around. I've been around long enough to remember when uh, Steve was uh, highly rumored to be the notorious blogger known as Wally Edge. <laughs> and um, I just want to thank you for the, uh, the platform that you're providing uh, for, you know, many, for every competitive um, congressional district. And I think your debates will be the best seen, the most seen um, of all the others. And, you know, I went looking for the uh, Southern Chamber of Commerce debate to prepare for tonight and I couldn't find it on, online anywhere. So I know, I know, you know, this will be viewed by thousands of people and, and you did great. In terms of who won the debate, it was hands down, David Richter. What the, the voters of the third district saw tonight was the difference between a bureaucrat in Andy Kim and a leader in David Richter. Um, <clears throat> a Andy said in, his, in the answer to your question about the, uh, the VA hospital, you know, he said, but David, you don't understand how it works. And he said, which is something that he had said earlier. He, Andy learns the rules and stays in his lane and he gets trained as a bureaucrat. And David's a leader. And David nailed it when he said a strongly word, worded letter after the fact is not getting it done. And I know if, a, a, if David's a congressman, say like Chris Smith was, Chris, you know, David's gonna call the people that he's already developed relationships with in the VA and get that deal done. Where he's gonna call the landlord, you know, who started querying that deal in, um, um, in Ocean County, and he's gonna bring the people to get it done. And he's gonna say, well, it's my job to just empower the commandant. And, you know, Andy, you know, Andy says, oh, I'm fighting. And then he said, trying for, um, for small businesses on your last question. Trying isn't doing it. If he re really wanted to be done, he would break from Nancy Pelosi and he would pull not for this Heroes Act that's got trillions of dollars of stuff not related to COVID at all, but he would, he'd be a leader of a caucus to make this happen. He'd really be bipartisan. Instead, he's just doing what he's told um, in, in Congress. And his, you know, what David just destroyed him on a foreign policy and, um, and ISIS. You know, he, you know, he just... What are you drinking tonight, Art? That's not what <laughs> I said. Sorry. Ordering coffee. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, Assemblyman Peters, I mean, you you are a Navy SEAL. Uh, so so this is an area of your your your, your particular expertise. Uh, do you feel that, uh, that Congressman 
Kim's statements on his 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 defense of his role at the White House, uh, advising President Obama on foreign policy. Do you do you feel that do you accept the answers that he gave? I would just say he can't have his cake and eat it too. I mean, he was either there and he was. Uh, I mean, I was going back again, a little outside of the scope, but I, I sat for the, uh, the, the Andy Kim, Congressman MacArthur debate that the South Jersey Chamber of Commerce held. And by my count, um, you know, uh, Congressman Kim said situation room and, and national security counts up, upwards of 50 times. So back then when he was running and saying, I played a big part and I was a really big part and um, actually fought back when they said he was a low level staffer and had, you know, generals write letters and say how much he had crafting this policy and being part of it. And then now saying, well, you know, it doesn't really come back to anybody. It's, it's not even one person. Um, and kind of, again, reframe the debate like an attack on public servants. So, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's either he owns it and says, hey, I was in the situation room. I was there. I know big decisions. Um, or, hey, I had nothing to do with it. So don't blame me. I think you just need to pick one or the other. And Sam, yeah. what do you think? Can I say something here? You know, we all, we all are in positions where we have um, consultants and we have folks who guide us and they make recommendations to us and they sit in on our policy. And, and Ryan, you know this as well. You have staff that helps you craft policy and help you implement it. You don't sit there and take every single step that, th that your staffer wants you to do. You will listen to them and you will be guided. But let, let's face it, the old ultimate decision was not Andy Kim, whether or not he decided what happens in Iraq. This was um, a military and all of the other folks that were involved in this. It was their decisions at higher ranks. Andy was there. The congressman was there as an advisor. He was there as a, as a person who was advising and counseling. He wasn't there to make the decisions. And I think Andy showed today, and he has been staying this for the last three years, that he, yeah, he was reliant on his decisions. His decisions were relied on, but he didn't make the decisions. He advised, he, he consult them. And if we sit here and keep saying that Andy was responsible for the Iraq war, the rise of ISIS, well, you know what, then we should be anointing Andy Kim right now because he's able to cure everything in the world. But it's just not the fact. The fact is that you have people who advise you and that's what Andy Kim did. He did not make those decisions. So let's stop with trying to bring this into play that Andy Kim was responsible for ISIS. And that's well, what probably, I Nobody would be doing that assembly one probably if Andy didn't, wasn't boosting up his, uh, inflating his resume. And I, I got a, I, I was an offended you know, and Brian, you, as a Navy SEAL, I, I don't know how you felt, but I thought he came dangerously close to stolen valor tonight when oh, uh, no. multiple Come cases on. he said he, he risked his life. No, you know, Will had, take, take it off, Art. Listen, David Richter didn't want to talk about how he uh, uh, was basically running. I think he's running for Congress in Philadelphia because he created more jobs there than he did in New Jersey uh, recently when he took people from Marlton and moved them over to Philly. You know, it just, it just to me, it reeks of hypocrisy. Here's a guy who was gonna run for Congress in Miami. He's, he's run, this is now the fourth place in three years that he's registered to vote now, okay? I mean, Ryan Peters, I mean, why aren't you running for Congress right this year? Why aren't you doing this? Why are you letting this guy run? He doesn't even live here, come on. I mean, you know better. This guy, this guy is, he has been voting and living in Mercer County since 1999. I mean, come on, this is ridiculous. He's not one of us. And yeah, and you know what? I, I just want to step back, chart. You know, our stolen valor. I I do take a personal offense to that. I'm a I'm a daughter of a Bronze Star Master Sergeant who fought in Korea, who fought in Vietnam, who died of Agent Orange when I was 17 years old. And let me tell you something. He did not make decisions, but he carried out the orders that he was given because he was a soldier. And that's what you do when you're in the military. You have men and women uh, now, so more women who are in those positions who carry out orders and who, who give you orders. And your job is to, is to continue being that military soldier. You're not there to buck the system. You're there to carry out orders. So let's make no mistake. He didn't walk any fine line on any type of broken valors or misleading. He said, he, he, said he put his life at risk in Afghanistan. Pardon me? He said he put his life at risk in Afghanistan. Well, what do you think, Have you been to Afghanistan? 
you go to Afghanistan, you put your life in that danger. You go to a lot of places, you put your life in danger. You you put your life in danger when you enter any type of war zone. So let's let's not let's not pretend or let's not make Andy Kim into something or saying things that he has not said. This is not about That's what he said. Yeah, well, you do. You put your life in danger when you go to Afghanistan. It doesn't matter. Not a bureaucrat. What you're all right, let me move. I want to move on to another issue. Uh, and, and Assemblyman Peters, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you this first. Uh, there have been a lot of questions about Mr. Richter's residency. Uh, you are a South Jersey guy. You are, you, you are a legislator representing uh, uh, Burlington County and, and other South Jersey counties. Uh, are you satisfied uh, with, or, with David Richter's answer on, on residency? Yeah, I mean, well, I would say two things. He's, he does own, own a home in the district in Ocean County. Um, no. Where? <clears throat> owns a home? All right, well, I'm sorry. Where, where's that, Ryan? Well, I was told Avalon. So I, I haven't been there and I, I certainly haven't confirmed, but I'm, I'm told he owns, he has a house in Avalon in Ocean County. Um, still Avalon, maintains Avalon, his Ocean residence County, like, like Mikey wrong, Sherrill. Wrong district. Hold on, hold Mikey on. Mikey Sherrill ran. Mikey wrong Sherrill district. didn't live in her district. Um, when... Um, the late John Adler's wife, uh, David, helped me with your with your your immediate recall brain uh, when she ran against Runyon. What, what was her name? Uh, Shelly Adler. Yeah. Okay. Well, she she lived in Cherry Hill when she ran uh, on CD three. This this adds a whole list of folks who never lived in the district and then ran for the district. I think noticeable was this the nuance that Congressman Kim had when he said, "Hey, I was I was born and raised in this community, not in this district." Uh, he, he went to Cherry Hill, I believe, East or West High School, not in CD3, uh, moved out, didn't live in CD3, lived in D.C., came back, got a condo in Bordentown while he was living and his wife and kid down to D.C. while he ran for Congress. Wasn't from here, didn't own a house here, rented a, a condo in Bordentown while he ran. So I, I just think everybody, this residency thing has is, is been played out. Nobody apparently lives where they're going to run anymore. Um, certainly if I lived, if I ran in CD3, I'd be one of the few that lived here and ran for it. But, uh, you know, David Richter is not standalone, uh, Shelly Adler, Mikey Sherrill, uh, a Andy Kim himself. No one lives in this district. And uh, Congressman MacArthur, they don't live in this district and run for it. So I use so David Richter has a home in Island Heights, which is in the district. Yeah. And, um, the, um, and yeah. I, I agree with Ryan. It's not that important an issue. Who's going to get the job done? You know, if Ryan's not running or Mo Hill's not running, um, you know, it's you've got to chip, pick, pick between the two that you got, and neither one of them have really strong ties to the district. I'll grant you that. So they grew up in the district. Steve, would you? Would you? And so did and so did Andy. You know, and they both came back to the district to run for Congress. And so it's a, it, 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 you know, it's not a, it's not a good issue for one or the other. David's got a more re recent history and. You know, I would not recommend that someone go to Harvard to figure out how to become a congressman and then district shop. But he won the nomination by a large margin. He, he, he destroyed it in Ocean County. Ocean County is coming out big for President Trump and Ocean County is going to take David over the top. So, Steve, let me let me ask you this question. There was uh, Congressman Kim gave it to to Andy, uh, to, to David Richter. Uh, I keep saying Andy Kim and Andy Richter, and it's it's. Sometimes it's, it's a little confusing, so I, I, I apologize. But but there was a lot of talk about Dave Richter's career at Hill International, uh, and he offered an explanation as to the circumstances of his departure from his family business after it went public. Steve, did he did he address those issues uh, enough hardly. to by the voters? Yeah, no, hardly he did. I mean, he talked about. Um, ducking the issue of the $500,000 SEC fine. I mean, how many candidates running for Congress in New Jersey right now have that lingering over them right now? Um, and, and it's pretty serious. I mean, it's something that happened under his watch when he was CEO of the company. Um, you know, and not only that, but he, he took money for bonuses for his family, luxury vehicles, vacations he didn't take. Um, and the board, you know, admonished him for this. And so he didn't want to talk about that tonight. And I understand why he didn't want to talk about it, because it's, it's obviously a stay in his career. Uh, but, you know, again, you know, this guy is so extreme, David. And, you know, I have a question for Ryan Peters. I'd like him to address right now, which he seems to be ducking me on it. 
um, is does, does he support the same idea about face masks? But they should Keep do talking. Really Save sense. that for next year when Ryan's running again. No, no, no. I, look, I don't, I don't know where this debate is going. No, 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 no. Save that for 2021. Don't try to get Ryan had his facts wrong to get about... to next year, Steve. Come on. One, Let's one thing I could say. I'm not, yeah, not make a quote that you can use against them next year. Don't fall for it, Ryan. No, look, I'm not making. I'm not running for Congress. I don't know where this where this analysis oh, is going. No, not now. I'm you're not running right. for Congress. It's not happening. So we can. We got, I'm sorry, and then it, we missed. So, Steve, what was your? I, I didn't. Don't know. ask him. What you, agree, you agree? You agree with David Richter? Richter. You supported him. You endorsed him this week. You endorsed David Richter. He says we should do away with masks and that we should reopen everything as if there's everything is normal, back to normal. Do you agree with that? So, so I, maybe maybe there was a technology delay that I missed, but I never heard David Richter say he wouldn't do it. Do away with masks. What I, yeah, what I heard did. Andy Kim do, as it sounds like you're doing, is conflating the safety protocols and opening up our economy. Now, I thought David Richter separated those out and said, look, I think we need to be safe, socially distant, wear masks, and we also need to bring our economy back. Now, later, Congressman King came back and said his line at the end about jobs and you know, small business, the first ones to get hit and the last one to recover, and I hope they come back, which seems like he wants to then open up our economy so there's small businesses and I think he, he mentioned the Rambo diner and brick that they're not going to survive the winter season. So what exactly is he saying? If he's saying we should, does he, I, what exactly I are you he saying, wants to open everything up. But what exactly are you saying? Do you support his position on this issue or, or don't you? Yes or no? He's going to appear in, a, in an ad in 2021 when you're running for re-election. No, it's a fair game. It's a fair question. I'm not running for office. He, he is. So right, what but, is next year, but next year. No, what is the answer? Boy, years, what is the answer? Wow. Well, very quickly here, I don't know. This is so. So let's. I, I answered the question. It's, you didn't. Not, yeah, not. Do you, a, are, do you want to do away with masks, and do you want to stop the the uh, and just reopen the economy right now in New Jersey as it as it was when things were normal? Yes or no? I want to ask Assemblywoman Murphy a question, which is which is on the joint base. Did huh. and that is that is you you're you're a legislator who represents Burlington, uh, hugely important issue. Uh, did the candidates properly address the needs of the, the future of the joint base? Hands down, Andy, Andy did. And on a, on a personal note, I've been um, on the joint base several times and I've been asked to attend when the congressional delegation has been there and Andy has shown up every single time. Andy has been very supportive of the, um, the joint base we have had many, we've had a few round tables with many of the members of the veterans and the joint base. He has been an integral part of a lot of research that I have done. And I, and I have to tell you that as we move forward, um, I would rely heavily on Andy Kim, if you wanna tie this into business because our joint base is an economic develop, uh, driver. You know what? I, I trust Andy Kim to be able to help be able to help move that in a positive direction. And it goes back to, you know, something I heard David Richter bring up and maybe a question you asked about the KC, um, the KCs that came in. You know what, Andy was a big supporter of those KCs coming in. And um, I was with Andy when he talked to the, at the time it was General Richardson when he was still the commander on the base. And you, you wouldn't have found a more supportive uh, congressman than Andy Kim has been to the joint base. So um, I, I can't say joint base more than five times in a sentence, but you know, um, I, I, I see that Andy has a clear passion for making sure that we in a society, one, are protected. Two is that joint base continues being a strong economic driver, continue being a, a protector of New Jersey and our surrounding areas. And um, I would I would say that Andy is the man for the job to be able to do that in Congress. Everybody wants the joint base to flourish, but the K-16 Pegasus uh, deal was done by Congressman MacArthur and Congressman Smith when Andy was working for the Obama White House. And let me let me ask Assemblyman Peters uh, as the as as the Navy the Navy representative on this uh, in in this. Uh, uh, forum. Uh, were you satisfied? Uh, not as a Republican, not as a legislator, but but as as somebody who who could get called up for active duty sooner. You are you were you satisfied with the answer your congressman gave? 
No, I, I, and I think Assembly Woman Murphy just summed it up as well. I mean, I didn't, I didn't visit the base. I grew up on the base. I, I played soccer there growing up on Dilboy Field. I went there and I worked there through law school as a, as a defense contract industry. As I went and went law, part-time at law school at night, and I went back and visited. I mean, Congressman Saxton, he nominated me to the Naval Academy, and he was the one who prevented it from BRAC and made it a joint base. And I so really we're not allowed to talk about 2021. There. So when you say <laughs> now, I mean, I, Congressman MacArthur brings in the KC-46s, and so far, Amy Kim has nothing other than what I heard Assemblyman Murphy said was uh, study groups, meetings, strongly worded letters, was I think what David Richter said, but no results. I mean, nothing new has come in. There's buildings there that still have asbestos that need cleaning, that nothing has been brought in, no money to get rid of those. There's really, in two years, he can bring nothing to the table and say, I brought this back to the joint base. Nothing. There's nothing there to say I had it. So, and, and I didn't hear anything about the future other than I'll continue to do uh, the KC-46s that my predecessor brought in. I, don't, I didn't hear anything about what's coming to fix the base or make it better because it's always on, on, on the chopping block to be BRAC. Um, you know, the, the, the flight pattern coming in is blocked from the north and blocked from the south, so that they have to go out in the ocean and come in. It's, it's hard. So you need ways to make it palatable or, or it's going to go. And it's an $8 billion economic engine that could go away if we don't continue to build into it. And it needs federal money to come back and take care of it. Missions need to come in that need to be won by a congressman. And I just I didn't hear how that's going to happen during this debate. So, Steve, let me ask you this question. Then I'm going to I'm going to ask the same question of Art, which is, you know, we we heard a lot about these candidates and we heard them talk about their views. But uh, I think I use the word omnipresent. Donald Trump is an omnipresent force uh, in this race. Steve, how much of this contest is really about Andy Kim and David Richter and how much of it is really about uh, the performance of Donald Trump and Joe Biden in the third district? Well, well, it's both, a lot's at stake. And you, know, you heard what David Richter said earlier today, he wouldn't fight for a constitutional amendment to protect Roe v. Wade. I mean, that, this is like, you know, I think any woman that listened to this debate tonight and heard that would recognize that the contrast couldn't be more clear Yes, Donald Trump is on the ballot. Yes, it is an important thing, and it's going to have a major impact on this race. But, you know, uh, don't forget the importance of Congress, the importance of uh, what's going to happen in this election. If this is a close race nationally, you know, and it comes down to the Electoral College and, and Congress, you know, um, it, it is going to be absolutely critical. And then for, for women and for senior citizens, and the idea that if a, a Trump second term would mean a lot for the privatization of Social Security, for example, and Medicare. I mean, these are things that these radical uh, Republicans in Washington, the Trumpers, are advocating for. And I just don't understand why, you know, David Richter, out of the box, the first thing he says is, I'm running to be an advocate for Donald Trump in Congress. But what about South Jersey? I mean, he's, he's living in Bonnie Watson Coleman's district. Uh, Ryan Peters doesn't think that's an issue, but I do. I just think it's as disingenuous that he's running to be Donald Trump's advocate and not the, for the people of Ocean and Burlington counties. So our President Trump in 2016 won this district by six percentage points. If if Donald Trump wins the third by that type of a margin again, uh, can Democrats hold that House seat? No. No, they can't. And Donald Trump is going to destroy in Ocean County, in the Ocean County portion of the district. Uh, everything that they, they, uh, Steve just said about David uh, helps David. And uh, you know, David should make a commercial out of it for and play it only in Comcast in, um, in Ocean County because um, Ocean <laughs> County is Trump country. And, um, and the, the 4,000 vote difference um, that uh, Andy won by uh, two years ago is going to come out, you know, two or three or four times fold. It's over. No, no matter how much money Andy's going to outspend David you know by. Art, you just raised a very good point. Not to cut you off, but you raised a very good point. Does that mean that Ryan Peters next year is going to run as Trump's advocate in the legislature? <laughs> I'm talking about this race. We'll de we, I mean, we can debate that <laughs> next year. If Ryan hires me, he'll win by a win. Burlington County, Ryan. Come on, you can be a hero here. Let's see what you got. Come on. Uh, I want to reward Assemblywoman Murphy for 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 staying out of this. The, the 
Well, she she has her own consultant. Right. <laughs> Assemblywoman, tell me tell me about Burlington County. Burlington County has shifted uh, since since the last time a Republican won uh, this congressional seat. Uh, Democrats have uh, swept Burlington County. What does it look like now? What does it look like in terms of of your county's ability to offset the Ocean County Republican advantage? Who, who are you asking, me or Ryan? You, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm not the assemblywoman. Yeah. <laughs> I thought he said assemblyman. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know what, look, um, to, to be honest with you, um, I haven't seen David Richter in Burlington County and I can't tell you tell you how, I, I can't even tell you any time I've seen David Richter in Burlington County. Um, Andy Kim is everywhere in Burlington County. Andy Kim is part of Burlington County and Burlington County is gonna come out heavily for Andy Kim, especially the women. The women in Burlington County are going to um, come out and show their support for Andy Kim because they believe in Andy Kim's one thing that was said is about Roe versus Wade. Andy Kim has stood with women throughout everything that has happened through the healthcare triggers for their family, Morristown, Matt Laurel, Evesham, all of us in, in here are saying that we need Andy Kim in here because you know what, he's proven that he is for women's rights. He's proven that a woman, whether you're pro-choice or pro-life, he shows that women needs to have the choice to make their own decisions about when they want to start a family, when it inherits for them. They're not gonna sit up there and say, well, you know what, normally, um, you know, normally I'm not for abortions, but I am for pro-choice. Like, what is that? That's saying, hey, either you're pregnant or you're not pregnant. There, there, is no, there is no delineation between saying that normally I wouldn't be for abortions, but you know, I am pro-choice. That, that's, trying, that's trying to have your cake and eat it too. Yeah, David, so, I, I mean, I would say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's okay, that's okay, right. But you know, I mean, that's what David Richter stood up today to say. Was David that- was very clear that he's pro-choice. And, uh, <laughs> and, and <laughs> David, he, yeah, that was he, so and he didn't he said he didn't he said he didn't think it was gonna happen, it wouldn't be overturned. Well, and Kim didn't say he supported a constitutional amendment either. But you know what? Look, what asked him. First of all, you know what? Not saying that it's not gonna happen. Does David Richter have some insight to Trump that he, he said knows the fact that it's not gonna happen? He said he's pro-choice. But whether he's pro choice or or like, like, with every exception in the book, right? He didn't or, say that. Oh, come on. He didn't obviously oh, listen to he didn't say debate. that. He didn't even listen to the same debate. Yes, I did. I, I, I bring, bring, bring it back to David's question. Look, guys, as a woman, I can honestly say that um, I, I, if I had to put my money on that Trump is not going to try to um, – try to overturn Roe versus Wade, I guarantee you that I will come out as a clear winner that he will overturn Roe versus Wade. He's made that Trump commitment. is on the record that he that he's um, he wants over oh, Roe v. Wade overturned. Oh, no. I agree with you. Trump wants Roe v. Ro Wade overturned. And you know what? So he puts on a way doesn't. And let me tell you something. The woman that he put on is very competent. But there's one thing that I saw, to, uh, I saw on TV the other day. And it is that the that the, the candidates that he chose from have been pre-selected ahead of time from the federal sons. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me tell you that these women are being, are, this woman that's being put on the board, very accomplished, very smart, young, you know, a, young, a young woman who's going to do terrific on there, but there's one thing that she is going to do. If Donald Trump says, let's, let's try to overturn Raid versus Wade, and she is, pro-life, not pro-choice. And let's make a mistake. There's no woman, and I can say this as a woman, there's no woman in this nation, in this world that sets out to have an abortion every single day. These are choices that women have to make because they are. there are all kinds of reasons why they have to make it. So let's make no mistake. And being pro-choice is not about abortion. It's about a woman being able to choose what decision she makes for her life. 
Amen. David, can I get in just because this is kind of going off the rails? It, it is going off the rails, but I have to say, when we're, when we're sitting here trying to say that, you know, David Richter will support a constitution or won't support a constitution or, and Andy Kim never answered that, let, let's move this forward because it's all conjecture. It's all speculation, what could or could not happen. And I would not put it past that the day that this happens and, you know, God forbid if, if Trump wins the presidency again, that's going to be the first thing on his agenda. And I guarantee it will be approved if we go forward with our court selection. Assemblyman Peters, you've been very patient. So let me let me let you speak. I'll just go back to your original question was, you know, Burlington <laughs> County. And I think Art's right is, is David Richter is going to crush in Ocean County. And what I heard tonight was David Richter saying things that are going to play very well in Burlington County, that he's for Roe versus Wade, that he is, that he, and he supports it and that he is for the Affordable Care Act. And, you know, I, I think going back to those things and, you know, because when you say Roe versus Wade, it brings up uh, Judge Amy Conan Barrett and to say, you know, it was a power play. I think that was a, a misstep uh, by Congressman Kim because, you know, history is, you know, it's written down, you can reference it. The reason that they have this opportunity to, to put in this justice is because Harry Reid abolished the 60 vote uh, threshold to put in judges because he was tired of not putting in judges. So he made it a majority, not a super majority. And now this is, you reap what you sow. So when you come back and say, hey, this is a power grab, yeah, absolutely. It was one Harry put in place and it's one that's going through. And I think when we go back and forth, President Trump is in the executive branch. He doesn't make the law. So he can't just come saying, I'm going to I'm going to yell overturn Roe versus Wade. It does. That's not how it works. And it's not like the, the, the Supreme Court runs in and says, OK, there is no case. There is no jurisprudence. We agree with the president. And all of a sudden, everybody can run around and, and, and Roe versus Wade is overturned. There's a process. There's a place. There's a, there's a judge who has a long history that you could research and she, she puts it in there. There's 51 votes to get her in, which is already there. I don't see the issue. Call it a power grab is to, is to correctly point out the issue that Harry Reid made a power grab and now it's blowing up in his face. So you're okay, Ryan, with running on, on David Richter's radical agenda next year? All right. <laughs> <laughs> don't fall for it, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you already, I don't know why I would run. Ryan Dude, Peters already fell for David Richter. This, this is this awesome. Week. I love it. You already fell for David Ryan. Richter. So, wait, so, let's, so, David, so, David, let's go back one step. So I'm going to answer the original question that I thought this is where Ryan was going. We have local races in Mount Laurel. Morristown and Isham, that is going to drive the vote up tremendously, the Democratic vote. So that is where we're going to see a lot of the Democrats come out and vote uh, this this year. And we're going to see a lot of Burlington Countyans come out and do that. So these three towns, which, by the way, Isham and Mount Laurel are the two largest towns in Burlington County, is going to drive up this vote along with Morristown. So that's why we're going to see Andy Kim be successful and win it hands down in Burlington County. So I want to ask one last question before we stay on so long that nobody is watching us and I morph in from I morph into David Cruz because absolutely nobody is watching what I have. He does wear his jacket, David. <laughs> Cruz does wear his jacket to uh, interview. <laughs> I would have I, I had on my list to ask of the candidates and and I and I didn't get to it. Uh, Andy Kim has turned into a monster fundraiser and he raised two million dollars of three months. He's raised $6.2 million since taking office. Uh, there are millions of dollars from outside uh, expenditures coming in, uh, independent expenditures. I don't know how much, uh, it, it maybe Art or, or, or Assemblyman Peters uh, uh, know the answer to this. I didn't have a chance to ask how much Dave Richter has raised over the last three months. But, but let me ask you this question. And I'll, I'll start with you, Assemblyman. Uh, I should just say commander because that'll differentiate between the two legislators. But but let me ask this question. You you were last year. We're not going to talk about next year. But last year uh, you were on the receiving end of some some super PAC spending. Uh, how is there a point where where this money becomes so insurmountable? that it doesn't matter what happens at the top of the ticket. It doesn't matter what happens anywhere else. It's just a, such a tremendous amount being thrown at you that it's not as competitive a race as people think. 
No, I mean, look, Steve's boss, George Norcross, he spent as much money as he could. Steve tried his best. Carol and her husband tried the best. They threw everything at me and they lost. So clearly it's money is not uh, always everything. It comes down to the candidate um, and what they stand for and what they believe in. So I think David put forth a, a good message tonight. Uh, I'm not sure what Andy has to stand on. He didn't come back and say, these are all my accomplishments. So in the end, they're going to have to judge themselves. But no, it's clearly not the, the person that's most well-funded. I mean, you can back anybody, but uh, in the end, um, it comes down to the candidate, the message and what resonates with the people. Does that mean you're not going to raise money then? Oh. Well, no. Andy Kim's not raising the money either. <laughs> Nancy Pelosi's raising it because she needs to keep that seat. Andy Kim can't raise that kind of money, but Nancy Pelosi can and tell, she tells people where to send it. Oh, okay. And she needs that. You know, come on, Steve, you know. Andy Kim works very hard. This, I mean, he's, he's a hustler. He works hard. And so I give him a lot of credit for what he's been able to accomplish, both as a member of Congress and as a candidate for office. It's, it's not easy to raise that kind of money. You wouldn't be getting all that money. Excuse me? If he didn't vote to for Nancy Pelosi for speaker, he wouldn't be getting all that money. Oh, okay. Says who? Art Gallagher. Okay. There you go. <laughs> okay, with with that, this has been this has been a lot of fun. I, I this was fun. Thanks. This is great. I don't I don't want to diss the 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 debate that I moderated, but but you know, I I like this. This is <laughs> It was fun. It's Steve, like I appreciate it. That was a good time. I'm not right. <laughs> <laughs> all good fun, Ryan. It's all good. It's all good. Oh, good. All right. Well, thank you very much. And, and, and Commander Ryan Peters and Assemblywoman Carol Murphy, Steve Askew, Art Gallagher, thank you very much. And I, I think uh, I think now at a at a quarter eleven, this will will bring tonight to a close. Uh, but hey, wait, wait, I have one request from you. If you're going to call Ryan Peters commander, because I, I am competitive, you got to call me deputy majority leader. That's all I'm asking. Okay. Fair, <laughs> fair enough. We will, we will stop on that. I will give it. You've got <laughs> hey, you everybody. Have a, a good night. Stay safe. And we'll all talk soon. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good night.